This week marks the one year anniversary of the longest government shutdown in U.S. history and some workers still haven't gotten paid. We'll speak with NEFI IM Executive Director Steve Lenkart and IAM Government Employees Director Jim Price. Activate Live starts now. Activate your voice. Activa tu voz. Speak up, speak out, get involved, get involved. Engage toi, take action. Activate deine Stimme. We're union and we're proud. I'm Tanya Hutchins coming to you from Machinist Union Headquarters. We'll get to Jim and Steve in just a moment. But first, last week we told you how some of our IAM Southern Territory members were voting to allow the union to speak to Spirit Aerosystems about extending their current contract amid pending layoffs. The vote to talk to the company passed, the talks happened, and now members are scheduled to vote on a three-year extension. In the meantime, resources are available to the 2,800 members affected by the layoffs. So grab a pen or create a note on your phone. The first place to start is the District 70 website. That's d70iam.org, d70iam.org. Mario's Food Pantry provides non-perishable food items and hygiene products to those who need them. The pantry is part of the Labor and United Way's Live United Partnership. There's also a resource guide listed in District 70's website. You can click on one page resource. The IAM's Employee Assistance Program is also available. You can call the National Helpline at 301-335-0735. That's 301-335. 3350735 Other resources include the US Department of Labor's Rapid Response Services along with the unemployment insurance. The Kansas Department of Labor also offers unemployment benefits and the Kansas Department of Commerce has rapid response as well. Kansas Works has help at all workforce center locations including the centers of South Central Kansas, the Salvation Army in Wichita, and the United Way of the Plains are also offering resources. Again, this is just a sample of the help available. Much more information is available on the District 70 website. An IAM delegation attended last weekend's AFL-CIO Martin Luther King Jr. Civil and Human Rights Conference in Washington, D.C. Union members came to the nation's capital from all over the country for workshops and strategy sessions. General Secretary Treasurer Dora Cervantes served on a voting rights panel. The theme of the conference was give us the ballot and focused on access. Saturday morning's activities included community service. Machinists painted a home that houses formerly homeless veterans. The organization is called Veterans on the Rise. Members also volunteered at a nursing home. So it was such a weekend of giving back. Well, it's been nearly a year since the longest government shutdown in U.S. history. It ended January 25th, 2019 and lasted 35 days. Many federal services stopped and paychecks stopped. Some workers received back pay, others didn't. Joining us now is NEFI IAM Executive Director Steve Lankert. Thanks for being here, Thank Steve. Thank you, Tanya. Appreciate it. So first tell us, who does NEFI IAM represent? Well, we, we represent, we're all over the government, all over the federal government. We represent federal employees from the Department of Defense, uh, the um, Veterans Administration, um, General Services Administration, um, Department of Agriculture, U.S. Forest Service, um, and uh, federal, uh, federal, federal Aviation Administration, um, and uh, some Department of State employees, and uh, a bunch of another, and other offices and departments as well, too. Uh, too many to, to mention. Um, overall, uh, together, we represent over 100,000 federal workers. So let's go back a year. What was happening in terms of what led up to the shutdown? So, so uh, shutdowns are nothing new to government. And we've, we've I mean, since the 80s, um, they've been fairly commonplace um, for, um, you know, all for political reasons why the government shuts down. So, uh, it, typically, it's somebody is holding out to get something from the other side. They threaten to shut down government. Sometimes it goes too far and it just shuts down. What made last year's um, shutdown unique uh, and the longest one in the history of the government is that um, um, the White House, the House, and the Senate were all in agreement on appropriations uh, funding for um, fiscal year 19, which is the one that was up at that time. Everybody was in agreement going into December 
Um, some of um, President Trump's supporters con co um, uh, complained there wasn't any funding for um, uh, the wall separating the United States and Mexico uh, in, in the uh, appropriations for 2019. And so the White House was the first to pull back um, from agreement and appropriations. So we had only a few days left to get this massive bill pushed forward that the Senate had already approved, the House was on its way to approving, the White House had previously signed off on it. They pulled back and said, you know what, unless you put funding for a wall in there, we're, we're not going to let this go forward. So. Uh, Isn't that a shame that that gets in the way of, of workers' lives? It gets in the way of workers' lives, and also it was something that the White House um, had to agree had, had agreed to up till that point that it wasn't important. They said, "We'll deal with it, you know, 2019. Let's get appropriations done. Let's let's um, keep everybody on payroll through the holidays and um, and go from there." Uh, so when the White House backed out, uh, everything came to a grinding halt. And, and we started uh, uh, going into a shutdown um, in very late December, just a few days before Christmas. And it extended uh, all the way into uh, February, 35 days total. What did this do to federal workers' lives, their quality of life? So it was incredibly disruptive. So uh, it wasn't every federal worker, but it was 800,000 uh, out of about 2 million. So it was a huge chunk of the federal workforce. Um, and a lot of them, of course, in the uh, Washington, D.C. metro area and other larger cities across the country. Um, from a um, macroeconomic perspective, it cost the um, American economy over $11 billion, and those are hard numbers. Those are hard numbers. Soft numbers take it even higher, um, closer to $20 billion in lost revenue, um, lost productivity. Um, on the American economy. So it wasn't just federal workers, it was, it was all of America. But federal workers specifically, they, they discovered in late December that that paycheck they're expecting in the first part of January, after they've paid for holiday gifts, after they've you know, uh, secured flights and vacations for visiting relatives and families and, and all the things that they're doing, they found out that that paycheck probably wasn't gonna show up. So as you can imagine, it's devastating. And most federal employees live paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. So now um, you have 800,000 people who are worried about how they're going to pay their bills at the end of January. That is unbelievable. And you're right about people living paycheck to paycheck because most people in this country don't have huge savings. You know, right. they use that paycheck and it goes down to zero every two weeks until they get another one. Yeah. Um, going back to that time, you know, there were rallies, there were protests. We had a photo up earlier. Um, what do you remember, what stands out to you about how much people were fighting back and, and making their voices heard? So because of, because of the timing of this, because it was such a horrible time to have a shutdown, and um, because it came at a time when people are loading up their credit cards and you know they're paying for things they wouldn't ordinarily pay for um, um, throughout the year because of the holidays, it really put a lot of stress on people. And um, so we, we, we found that federal employees are very energized. Um, they were very willing to get involved. We had uh, two great rallies. Uh, one was outside of the AFL-CIO, and we marched all the way to the White House. Um, unofficially, the AFL said it was one of the biggest uh, protests they had ever had in front of the building. And we walked down as a huge group to the White House. It was a long line. The line was, was 20, 25 minutes long, uh, 10, 15 deep. Uh, marching from AFL down to the White House and where we had another rally there. And then we also had a rally in front of uh, uh, Nats Park um, when um, the Senate Republicans were on a retreat um, there to discuss their legislative priorities for, for uh, that year. That. So we went outside and, and, and we, um, we, we did some chanting Made some outside. Noise, to wake yeah. up. A little bit of noise to wake up Mitch McConnell, yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, Everybody, and there we have Randy Irwin there, um, who was at that rally as well. I remember that. You know, people who are watching at home, if they're members of the general public and they don't know a lot about unions and how the system works, what is the relationship between, you know, the agencies and, you know, contractors we haven't talked about yet? There may be some contractors um, watching. The OMB, tell us about how those relationships work. So um, ordinarily, um, when we decide as a country that funding the government is important and keeping our doors open and keeping the business of the American people going forward, when that's a priority, it all works quite well together. Um, federal employees work alongside contractors. Um, often, um, I mean, to the untrained eye, you wouldn't know the difference between a federal employee versus a contractor in, in most scenarios. 
Um, they're both specialists in their own areas. They come together and work on the same teams, and they do great work for the American government, by and large. Um, so, um, you know, when the system starts to break down, uh, such as this, and we decide that funding the government is not a priority, um, the federal employees are trying to figure out, you know, who is what they call essential versus non-essential, who needs to report to work and keep working, even though the government is quote-unquote shut down. Um, a lot of people still stay on the job. Some people are required to stay home, which means they just have to leave everything um, at their desk. They can't go on email. They can't uh, make phone calls, even though they want to work. They're actually prohibited by law from working. And the contractors are in the same boat as well, too. Some contractors show up for work and won't get paid. Some contractors are told to stay home under a stop work order. Um, but to all those people, it's incredibly disruptive. And it's also disruptive to the companies that are trying to retain these employees to work on site with federal employees as well, too. So um, the companies themselves are also um, get, get um, put between a, um, a rock and a hard place because they don't know how they're going to pay their people um, once the shutdown opens up again. You know, it's kind of ironic that the word contractors comes from the word contract, and the company has a contract with the government. And you would think, as a union employee, like you have to honor that contract. Right, right. I, it just amazes me that, that people do not get paid when, you know, everybody lumps it together as the government, but the government has to keep running. The government has to keep running. Uh, we did pass a bill uh, into law um, in uh, February of last year um, that um, provided that in future shutdowns, uh, federal employees will get back pay. Now, if the government shuts down, paychecks will stop again. But at least they're guaranteed that when the government starts up again that they'll get their pay. That wasn't a guarantee before this was passed into law. Uh, we attempted to pass the same law for contractors. Uh, we were not anywhere near as successful as we were the federal employees. Um, the idea was to pass a law that says that um, you know, after the, the shutdown is over, contractors get paid just like federal employees do. Um, but uh, we fell short of uh, uh, the votes on that, even though it was endorsed um, by a lot of lawmakers in both the House and Senate. That's a shame. As you said, they're working side by side. Side by side, yeah. Maybe we can turn them into federal employees full Well, time. you know, that's happened. <laughs> <laughs> that and it's going the other way, too. Wow. Federal employees become contractors, um, especially when they're at their end of their federal career and they wow. want to stay in the game. Wow. So how can this be prevented? Looking forward, in a perfect world, what would you like to see happen? Well, in a perfect world, we need to uh, elect better people to the House, the Senate, and the White House. And the people who understand that, above all, it's the mission of the American people that need to move forward no matter what. Uh, and any time we have a shutdown like this, it's disruptive at so many different levels, including the economy as a whole. Um, it was you know, hundreds of million dollars a day for, for this last shutdown. As I said, somewhere between 11 and 20 billion to the American economy over the holiday season that this one cost. So to say that this is, should be used as some kind of a political ploy uh, is, is, is simply unacceptable in somebody who doesn't understand the gravity of their responsibilities as a lawmaker or as president. What would you like NFIM members to remember moving forward? Well, definitely remember uh, if your um, congressmen and your senators, um, where they stood on the shutdown, if they were supportive of it, then those are people that need to go. Um, if there were people who were supportive of federal employees and contractors, the federal workforce, um, those are people that we need to support as much as we can. Um, and I would say um, to any of our members, um, go out and, and actively find out um, who your representative and senators, which side of the argument they are on. Well, thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, a you're welcome back anytime. Oh, we do have a comment here, and this is from Randy Irwin saying, back pay for feds after a shutdown was a huge win. We agree, Randy. Yeah, we sure do. Definitely. Yep. Thank that you so much. That was a so big one. Much. Thanks, Steve. Well, NEFI represents more than 100,000 federal workers across the United States. The IAM's Government Employees Department is responsible for responding to the changes that take place in the federal sector, keeping our members aware of those changes and representing them in good times and challenging times. IAM Government Employees Director Jim Price joins us now. Jim, I almost, I almost changed your name, Price. That's okay. We, we the last thing coming out. Yeah. Um, so, Jim, remind us, differentiate between NEFI IAM and the IAM Government Employees Department. Which workers does the IAM Government Employees Department represent? There is really no difference. Okay. Uh, the Government Employees Department basically is more or less, for lack of a better word, to you, let's use the parent organization for NIFI IAM Federal District 1. Uh, we 
collaborate a lot with each other on different issues that, that are out there. Currently, right now, there's uh, the executive orders that we're dealing with. We're collaborating on a lot of those things. Uh, the IAM uh, adds probably another 30 or 40,000 to that membership. Um, out of the department, though, directly, I represent or I deal with DOD, uh, all the agencies, uh, Department of Energy, the nuclear sites Y-12, and uh, Pantex in Amarillo, Texas, and uh, out in uh, uh, Arizona. So there's no real separation there. I, I think we all kind of pin, pin ourselves together sometimes yeah. in a room and go after it, you know what I'm saying? We're all in this together. Absolutely. Uh, for all of the people out there who are workers that may not yet be represented by a union, remind us what the end goal is of our representation when it comes to federal workers. The end goal, in my mind, is that we try to provide uh, representation for those folks. They can't, we can't negotiate wages or anything, but working conditions are very, very important in the federal sector. Uh, if you go to some of these facilities where uh, like the government printing office, uh, there's a lot of dangerous work that goes on there. I mean, you're printing money, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, no, you're print, printing passports at the government printing office, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And you're doing a lot of uh, machinery work as, if you're an IAM member. If you go to the uh, Bureau of Engraving and Printing, we're printing money, the same mm -hmm. thing. There's a lot of safety issues. There's basically uh, uh, work time, overtime, those types of things make a big difference to folks inside the, those organizations. If you're an employee out in Amarillo, Texas, uh, where we make uh, a lot of the nuclear uh, weapons uh, exposures, those things are real important. So that's what we try to strive for, try, try to strive to make sure that we give those folks that information necessary to protect themselves and also to basically uh, create a safer work environment. And that can affect morale, can't it, if you don't take care of those things yeah, in the workplace? Yeah, it, it does, and, and it's, no, it's no different than any place else where people work. I mean, it's just, it, it may mean more to the federal employee because of the fact that they don't negotiate wages. You know, the working conditions are really very important to them. Okay, we're in 2020 now. Yes, we are. Rules have changed. Yeah. What do you want our, our members to keep in mind moving forward? I think if you ask me that question, I, I think what I would really want all members to remember and to understand is, is that the federal workforce has had some significant pressure placed upon it. Um, as I've often come on this show and basically talked about the executive orders that basically we have that uh, take away the federal employee's right to uh, representation. Uh, they give you the official time, they've cut it, they give you official time, but you can't use it to represent the members. Uh, your collective bargaining rights have been limited, uh, whereas you, you have to negotiate ground rules and then those ground rules have to go to what they call an agency head review. Uh, those ground rules can be changed. You might have negotiated them at this table, but they can change. And just as the contract can change, I mean, they can implement any law or any regulation into that contract that they feel is proper. Uh, we've got a lot of, a lot of uh, hills to climb this year in the federal, federal sector. And even with office space? Uh, yeah, well, and that's part of those executive orders as yeah. well. There are a lot of folks in the, in the VA. Um, I know Steve is probably dealing with some of that. I know I'm dealing with it a little bit. Um, at the Army locations, they're being kicked out of their uh, office space. Uh, when I say that, they're being offered the opportunity to rent that space that they've been given for year ons, and now all of a sudden they want to, you know, kick them out if they can't afford to pay the rent to be there. So how can people get more information or if, if they're, you know, in need of information or Good something question. happens? Uh, they can contact my office uh, here at IM headquarters. Uh, uh, we're here uh, most every day. Our, my, my staff basically takes care of a lot of the things. They can contact me at any time. And I think we're posting a link we not only that. to the Government Employees Department right. but also to NEFI. Um, yes. in the comments on yeah. Facebook. Yeah, and, and there are things that we're doing right now, and this is, this is important. As I mentioned before, we don't, uh, membership doesn't have the right to uh, have their leadership or their, their shop stewards deal with them as, as far as grievance handling is concerned. We've created a couple of uh, pamphlets that basically we think uh, will be helpful for those folks. Okay. Uh, we're doing some stuff with collective bargaining. We're going to be putting that out here. It's, some of it's already out. We're going to be putting it out. 
it tells the member how they can help in the grievance process so that uh, we can get the information necessary when there's a violation to the steward because they still have mine garden rights. Okay. However, uh, and explain to people what that is because we also have yeah. workers. You don't have to do it word for word. No, or anything, but you, but you yeah. have the right. You have the right to basically, re you know, to representation. Mm -hmm. You have the right to ask for a steward. That simplifies it, right? What's that? Okay. You also have a federal employees basic program coming up. Um, and I know later on we're going to remind people what that deadline is. I think it's February 3rd, but we'll let yeah, you know we exactly. Yeah, we do have that coming up. Yeah, tell us a little bit about just how important that training is. It's the base for everything that, base, that a federal employee will, will need to navigate inside of their particular agencies. Now, this is part of the problem as well, Tanya. The official time is not there for these folks to attend some of these classes as well. So we've got a dilemma here. We're going to have to basically, you know, deal with that as we as we can. So we're looking at ways to good, get around that as well. I mean, I've mm -hmm. talked with Chris uh, Wagner at the school, and we may end up taking the show on the road. Yeah. But those classes are there. They're already set. They're in place. So we'll uh, get the information we, to yeah, the workers. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> you know, if we there's have to a, change the way that we do there's it. There's a collective bargaining class that's coming up, a federal collective bargaining class that's coming up this year. Uh, there are lots of things that we're trying to do with the federal employees. We need to get out there and deal with uh, the issues that we're dealing with. But as Steve mentioned, and he didn't put it in these terms, but I will, elections have consequences, whether we believe it or not. This uh, administration has not necessarily been healthy for any working person whatsoever. And I've said on this show before that uh, it's the federal employees today, it's the rest of the world tomorrow. Talk a little bit about the importance of voting in your best interest, because I know the IAM has a website, yeah. IAM2020.org, and I know yeah. we're veering a little bit yeah, here. Yeah, we are. <laughs> but, but you do have to vote in your best interest as a worker. Yeah. I, I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me that, that we, would, we would not support someone who basically was out there to... Uh, look out for what we need, the people need, rather than what, say, big business needs. The tax, the tax uh, bill that was passed, I mean, it, that was just ludicrous that basically the, the people that have all the money get more. I just think, you know, it is so important to support pro-labor candidates Absolutely. who know what it's like to be a worker yeah. and to know, as you said, that elections have consequences and, and laws have and consequences. And a, yeah, and another thing is if, if you're a member out there and you feel the need, run for office. Mm -hmm. Run for school board. Run for, run for your, your state legislature. Uh, that's a good way to help your fellow union member to progress. I think I heard a figure from the AFL-CIO, and yes. I think it might have been from the 2018 election, but it said something like eight or 900 union members ran for office. And won. And won. That is incredible. And won. You know, right. that is really taking things into your own hands. Let's keep it up. That's great. Anything else you'd like to mention before you leave? Just Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, we're, it, like I said, it's going to be a, it's going to be a long haul this year for um, the folks that uh, I deal with on a daily basis. Uh, we're going to end up having to do some things that, that are unique in order to deal with the representational issues and the collective bargaining issues and, and re, you know, just everything that, <clears throat> excuse me, that has to do with uh, federal employees. So don't give up out there. No. You have a lot of resources and support uh, here through NEFI IAM and, and the IAM, and we have those links um, hopefully posted by now to uh, the comment section on Facebook if you need more information. Thank you so much for stopping by, Jim. Not a problem. Jim. Not a problem. I always have good information with you and Steve, so thanks. Thank you. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So let us know what you think about government shutdowns, why they happen, and getting paid. Join the conversation right here on this video to activate your voice, whether you're on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, live or even during the replay. Now, we always like to take a look back on this program, and here's a look at This Week in Labor History. Oh, we have a comment. Joe just reminded me from Brian Stymax. He says, hello from local 1061, the picket line in West Hampton, New Jersey. Solidarity with you out there. We're all with you, thinking of you. So thanks for writing in, Brian. We are thinking of you. 
So taking a look back in labor history, we have on January 23rd, 1933, 6,000 workers walked off the job over wage cuts at Briggs Manufacturing Company in Michigan. That move sparked a strike wave of 15,000 auto body workers that paralyzed Detroit's auto industry. Scabs were brought in to keep production going. Although the workers were not rehired after the strike ended, their collective bargaining action, their collective action forced wage increases in the industry. On January 25th, 1937, Transport Workers Union members locked themselves in at the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit Corporation's Kent Avenue power plant after management fired two boiler room engineers for union activity. The workers announced that if the men weren't reinstated, they would shut down the city's subway system. And guess what? The two men were quickly reinstated without conditions. And on January 20th, 1986, the United States held its first observance of the Martin Luther King Jr. federal holiday. I remember that. I was 18 years old, and it was incredible. Well, classes at our Wimpersinger Education and Technology Center in Hollywood, Maryland are popular. So get those applications in if you'd like to attend. Federal Employees Basic Program, that deadline is February 3rd. Community Services Program has the same deadline. And the Intermediate Web Development class has a deadline of February 14th, Valentine's Day. Check the website, wimpersinger.iamaw.org. Our upcoming state council meetings include Florida State Council meeting in Tallahassee January 26th through the 30th. The Minnesota State Council meets February 8th and 9th. And the Nebraska State Council meets in Lincoln February 22nd. There is a retirees meeting at the Wimpersinger Center February 10th. And IAM Lobby Days take place in Ottawa, Canada February 24th and 25th. Well, that's all for today. Join us next week at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, right here on this same social media channel. And thanks to all of you who spread the word about Activate Live. We appreciate you.